Welcome to uh, the Natural History of Homolopsid Snakes. Uh, I'm John Murphy, and this is a, an update and a summary of what we've learned about uh, homolopsid snakes over the last uh, 25 or 30 years. Homolopsids are uh, a group of snakes that have uh, no known single characteristic that identifies them or a synapomorphy. It's not like a rat. They're not like rattlesnakes. If it's got a rattle, you automatically know that it, it belongs to the rattlesnake clade. Homolopsids, uh, however, share a suite of traits, but all of those traits are found in other snakes. So as far as we know, mon uh, homolopsids are monophyletic. That is, they shared a common ancestor. Uh, most are less than a meter long. There's a few that approach 1.2 meters in length. Until about 2012, uh, they were all thought to have grooved rear fangs, but now we know that some have no fangs at all. They have val valvular nostrils that they can close and open. Uh, when they dive, they close the uh, nostril so that water does not come into their upper respiratory system. The eyes are dorsolaterally oriented so they can uh, surface without exposing their head and and view the surrounding terrain. They have a tracheal lung, which increases their capacity to absorb oxygen into their bloodstream. As far as we know, they are all viviparous, and some of them have been documented to uh, have a placenta-like structure. They can either be uh, terrestrial, fossorial, semi-aquatic, aquatic, or marine, but usually they are some combination of those. So. It might be terrestrial and semi-aquatic, or it might be marine and uh, fossorial. And I use the term semi-aquatic and aquatic here to refer to using fresh fresh water as, as compared to uh, salt water. They tend to like muddy substrates, and uh, I've seen them actually dive right into uh, liquid mud and disappear. Vertical terrain seems to be a barrier for most of them. If they're living in a stream and the stream has a pretty good gradient to it, it's uh, it's usually a barrier to them moving. Uh, they they uh, won't disperse quite as easily as other snakes might. Almost all of them are tropical and subtropical, but there are two that get into uh, temperate China, and, and they may actually have to hibernate during the wintertime. Uh, they have diets that are fairly diverse, but most of them are either going to feed on fish or uh, crustaceans. And the prey is usually small, oftentimes less than 1% uh, of the predator's mass, sometimes maybe 5% of the predator's mass. And I have, I, unusually, I've, I've rarely have I found uh, prey that's like 20, 25% of the predator's mass. So the rear fang clades seem to have relatively toxic venom, and the uh, snake known as Morophis chinensis has been found to have uh, a venom that is about equal to that of some of the saw scale vipers. It's got an LD50 of about uh, equal to a saw scale viper, which is relatively toxic. So down there in the bottom corner uh, are some of the people who have worked with me on this project. Uh, actually, the project was the brainchild of Harold Voris on the far uh, left. Harold is the, uh, was the curator of reptiles and amphibians at the Field Museum in Chicago. Uh, next is uh, Professor Wachera, who is an ichthyologist at the uh, Prince of Songkla University in southern Thailand. Then myself and uh, Tanya Chenard from the uh, Science Museum in Bangkok. Daryl Carnes from uh, Hanover College and uh, Bruce Jane, Jane from the University of Cincinnati. So about 1992, uh, Harold Voris suggested that we work on these homolopsid snakes. And uh, at that point in time, the, the only paper that was uh, sort of the summary, a compilation of everything we knew about uh, homolopsid snakes was a paper uh, published in the uh, 
University of Kansas Publications Museum of Natural History was called a revision of colubrid snakes of the subfamily Homolopsinae, and it was written by Coco Gee. Uh, Gee was a uh, Burmese herpetologist who went to uh, school to get his PhD at the University of Kansas, and he was uh, William Dulman's first PhD uh, candidate. The paper was published in uh, 1970, and in that paper, Gee reported 35 species in 10 genera. And so we use that uh, paper as sort of the baseline for uh, starting our work. So in uh, 2007, uh, I had enough morphological data that uh, I put together the homolopsid snakes evolution in the mud book, which recognized 37 species in 10 genera. And we had discovered quite a few different uh, species, and we had also realized that they belonged in some different genera. In some cases, we were resurrecting genera, and the uh, 20, 2014 paper, a uh, checklist and key to the homolopsid snakes, uh, recognized 53 species in 28 genera. Evan Kwa uh, et al. came along in 2017 and added one species of Geopus and, re and raised it to 54 species. In 2020, there's going to be a new species in genus Disguise from Myanmar, and uh, uh, Harold Worth and I are going to describe a new species of Brachioris, and that'll bring the total species of homolopsids to uh, 56 by the end of this year, and it will be in, uh, actually it'll be in 29 plus genera. On the right here, you see this illustration that is from the checklist. We have speci species groups we have a list of species in that group, and then I've got a little map that, dump, that uh, illustrates the distribution, and then a photograph of one of the representative members of that group. And I'm going to use this to kind of keep track of where we're at in the presentation. So uh, only about 3% of the living species of snakes have been able to colonize marine environments. But the uh, oceans cover 71% of the Earth's surface, which suggests that uh, snakes have a pretty uh, significant challenge in adapting to uh, marine habitats. 10% of the living snakes are either aquatic or semi-aquatic in fresh water, but fresh water only covers about 1.7% of the Earth's surface. So fresh water is a much more friendlier environment uh, for, for snakes than is salt water. One of the goals of this project that we started it, we wanted to see uh, if we could determine how changes in sea level uh, impacted the snakes that were living in coastal regions, river deltas, estuaries, uh, coastal lagoons, uh, those kinds of habitats. And if you look at the sea level curve, it's for the last, it's just for the last five million years, you can see that uh, the dotted, the upper dotted line there is sea level currently. So if the, if the blue line is above uh, above the uh, line, sea level went up. If it's below the line, sea, line, uh, sea level went down. And you'll notice that um, about three million years ago, sea level started to drop and it would go up and down almost continually between three million years ago and the present day. There's a couple of places there where you can see it drop below 100 meters of where it is today. And in some cases, it went up about 10 or 15 meters above uh, where it is today. So if we look at the homolopsid snakes, you find the greatest diversity of them in Southeast Asia in uh, an area called uh, the Sunda Shelf and the adjacent uh, Indochinese Peninsula. So um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but... Uh, this is the Indochinese Peninsula. Here's the Malaysian Peninsula, Sumatra, Java, Island of Borneo. And this whole area in, in here in orange and browns is an area that's between about zero and 75 meters below sea level. So if sea level goes up, you uh, this is a little bit of animation. You can see the, the water starts to intrude. And as sea level rises, it fills in this area 
of low elevation. And that was just sea level rising. The reverse also occurred. It, it would drop back down. And as it does, it changes the ability of the snakes to move around. Some of the snakes may be able to move around more freely if they're, they're pretty much free swimming marine species. Uh, on the other hand, if they're freshwater and they uh, or terrestrial, it may restrict their, their movements. So this raise, uh, rising and falling sea level uh, increases the ability of snakes to make contact with other populations or decreases their chances depending upon what their habitats are. So the first place we went to uh, to study homolopsid snakes was uh, actually in Borneo, Harold Boris and, and Daryl Carnes went there and did some work on a snake called Hypsocopus plumbia, or the plumbius water snake. But um, the three of us ended up going to southern Thailand in 1997. And uh, Lake Songkla is uh, the largest lake in Thailand. And you can see that it's sort of a bright green color from all the algae growing in it. 200 years ago, this lake was a bay in the Gulf of Thailand, and there were some barrier islands between the Gulf of Thailand and the bay. With the help of humans, over time, uh, those barrier, the distance between those barrier islands got filled in and it isolated the lake from the bay. The lake became freshwater, and today you find the most diverse aquatic snake assemblage uh, that I know of any place on the planet in Lake Songkhla. So you find uh, the, uh, the little file snake, Acrocortis granulatus, which is primarily a marine species. You find the pipe snake and the uh, sunbeam snake, which are generally thought of as being sort of terrestrial, uh, semi-aquatic species, but they're, they're pretty aquatic uh, snakes. You find the Xenocrophus flavipunctatus, which is sort of like a North American water snake that moves in and out of the water and feeds on uh, frogs, primarily, sometimes fish. And then there are six species of homolopsids there and one true sea snake that has been trapped in that lake. Today, the only way to get in and out, for the water to get in and out or for marine and freshwater animals to get it in and out of the lake is right down here at the southern end of the lake. So this is a, a view of the lake. It's a big shallow water lake. There's a rainbow mud snake just below that picture. And then there's some couple of guys wading around in their waist in mud and muck. And they're actually fishing. They're picking up fish that got stranded in there by hand. And uh, any snakes that they would catch, they would give to us. We had uh, radio transmitters implanted in some of the uh, inhydrous and hydrous. And we also had a, a, uh, an array of funnel traps. And we would go out every morning, and, and the fishermen would get the uh, snakes out of the traps for us in bags. We know, knew exactly which trap they came out of. We'd pit tag those snakes and then turn, take them back and turn them loose where they were collected. We pit tagged about 235 snakes that year. And um, the idea was we were going to come back the following year. Let me make sure I got slides are out of order here a little bit. Um, this is a, a female in hydrus giving birth. Uh, in 1998, we went back, and uh, in the intervening year, the uh, monsoon had failed, and the rice farmers around the lake had pumped lots of fresh water out of the lake, letting salt water intrude, and it killed off many of the freshwater uh animals, the crabs, some of the mollusks, and all of the uh, anhydrous and hydrous. There's a photo of an anhydrous and hydrous there that was in salt water, and you can see that it's actually got salt crystals coming out of its, out of its skin. These, uh, these snakes do not do well at all in salt water. So uh, the, uh, one, the one thing we did was we collected DNA from all of the homolopsids that were fit to take a DNA sample from. And uh, using that information on, for anhydrous and hydrous, we discovered that the, the crown clade of, uh, I'm sorry, for all the homolopsids really, 
um, the crown clade of uh, Homo lapsids that's around today, diversified about 22 million years ago. And uh, that was found to be true by El Faro et al. 2008. And in a paper by uh, Hussam Zer and uh, colleagues, he also concluded that. And if you look at this uh, tree, you can see that the Homo lapsids there are up at the top where the red dot is. The, um, they, they crown clade diversified about 22 million years ago or so. And the family itself probably diversified or originated about 40 million years ago, according to this study. Some studies push it back a little bit, uh, a bit, little bit later. <clears throat> uh, Burbrink et al. recently did a study where they used whole genomes and, and a, or much more of the genome. And when they did this, they found uh, pretty much what other research had supported, that is, the xenodermatiidae or the odd-scaled snakes, the uh, the uh, Asian uh, snail and slug-eating snakes, the periidae, and the vipers, together all sort of form the sister for the homolopsids. And then the homolopsids were the sister for all of the other advanced uh, snakes that you see there, all of the the elapids, the lamprophids, the na the natricids, the dipsids, uh, and the colubrids, etc. The distribution of modern homolopsids ranges from uh, the pa Pakistan's Indus River Delta on the far uh, left of the screen, and they go out to Palau, Micronesia. But the greatest uh, diversity of species you find in the Indo-Chinese Peninsula and on the, on the Sunda Shelf. In uh, about 2010 or so, <clears throat> um, we obtained some tissue uh, from uh, Brachioris. And Brachioris is an unusual snake. Not much was known about it. But uh, Sam McDowell, uh, a herpetologist and anatomist, had carefully take, had looked at Brachioris anatomy pretty carefully and had decided that uh, if it had fangs, it would be a homolopsid. He didn't put it in the, in the uh, family, but he just suggested that it sure looked like a homolopsid, except for the fact that it did not have fangs. Uh, Kate Sanders from the University of Adelaide got some tissue, sequenced it, and um, ran it against all the rest of the homolopsids and some other snakes. And sure enough, it popped up right in the family homolopsidae as the most basal member of the, uh, of the family. And then we borrowed all of the specimens we could, labeled Brachioris, and in the process of doing that, we found Brachioris consisted of four species. But then we also found um, the, a genus called Calamophis, which had been actually described in about 1878, based on one specimen from Yapan Island, which is off the coast of New Guinea. I found uh, six other museum specimens labeled Brachioris, and they were all Calamophis. And they represented three different species. They were all from the bird's head region of Western New Guinea. And then we also found an, a very unusual looking Brachioris from Sumatra, which we placed in the genus Carnzophis um, based on that, on that one specimen. If you compare these photographs, you can see how distinct the, uh, the head is from uh, Brachioris. So Calamophis uh, is, is a very, they're all small snakes. And you notice the tail is just exceptionally short on these. The uh, posterior body is laterally compressed. And this to me suggests that they're, they're probably swimming and they're probably also burrowing. And uh, I think uh, there's been one other museum specimen located since I originally published his paper, I think Mark Wache and Heinrich Kaiser uh, found uh, one more specimen of one of the species. So the distribution of fangless clade is basically Indonesian, and Carnzophis is known only from Sumatra, Brachioris is known from the Malaccas, and Calamoff 
This is known from the bird's head area of New Guinea and Yapan Island. So the rear fang clade is uh, much more widespread. And uh, here you can see the, the fang structure of a homolopsis pucata, which is a fish-eating uh, snake. And you can also see the fangs of Fordonia. And in comparing those, you can, you can tell Fordonia has these very thick, robust fangs, which are superb for cracking into uh, through a crab shell and delivering a dose of venom. Whereas uh, that Homolopsis bucata fang would probably have a difficult time getting through a crab shell. So some of the study sites that we use for these rear fang Homolopsis that we worked on uh, in Borneo, in, in northern Borneo there in Saba, was where we did the uh, Anhydrous plumbia study. At the time, it was Anhydrous plumbia. Uh, we worked at Lake Sokla. We've already talked about that. We worked up on the Karat Plateau uh, in, uh, in Thailand, in central Thailand. And we also went farther north in the Thailand a little ways. Uh, the Andaman Sea coast of Thailand, we did a little bit of work on Cerberus. And uh, down in Singapore at Passer Riss and Sungai Bulo, we worked on Fordonia and Gerarda. In more Malaysia, Harold and uh, Bruce Jane, uh, in like two evenings, collected almost all of the specimens known for the snake called Bidia hydroides. We'll take a look at that snake a little bit. And then uh, at uh, Tanli Sap in Cambodia, uh, we did some of the preliminary uh, work with uh, uh, Sharon Brooks and John Reynolds, who studied the snake harvest there, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So one of the things we did after we had gotten a phylogeny together, we looked at how the diet played out against the phylogeny. And we found that Cantoria violacea, which at, in this phylogeny was the sister to all the rest of the homolopsids, was a shrimp eater. And then you, we had a series of fish eaters there at the top with homolopsis bucata and bucorti, and Cerberus rinchops and erpeton. And then uh, we, we still don't know for sure what anhydrous punctata eats. But uh, Myron Richardsonii is known to eat bo all, both fish and crabs. And recently it was shown to eat uh, sea slugs uh, or nudibranchs. And then Fordonia, Leucolabia, and Gerardia prevostiana are crab eaters and crustacean eaters. And then the other anhydrous all tend to be fish eaters with some of them uh, like in Hydrus plumbia and chinensis eating uh, frogs also. Since we did that, uh, Fab Ray et al. 2016 demonstrated uh, the similar head sh shapes in species that consume similar prey in the family Homolopsidae. So the crustacean eaters, on the, if you look at the diagram on the right there, uh, the crustacean eaters have a pretty wide head. And then the fish and urin and crustacean eaters, they're more generalists. They have sort of a slightly uh, more streamlined head. But the fish eaters have even a more streamlined head. And uh, basically showing a, a relationship between morphology and function. So um, the plumbia clade includes Ipsocopus uh, plumbia and Hypsocopus manitonensis, which is found only in uh, an island off the coast of Sulawesi. But it also contains an undescribed uh, monotypic genus from Sulawesi, which is quite interesting. Because uh, Plumbia is, is really one of the most terrestrial of the rear fanged homolopsids. And this undescribed monotypic genus from Sulawesi is highly aquatic. And so um, this is the Lake Tweedy homolopsid. It doesn't have a name yet, and that's another pretty long story that I'm not going to go into. But um, we do have a DNA sample from it. We know that it is the sister to uh, Hypsocopus plumbia. And uh, you can see that the top of the head, the eyes are, are dorsal laterally positioned. The nostrils are, are dorsal. The ventrals are pretty narrow. And the tail and the posterior body are strongly laterally compressed. 
and suggesting to me that it probably rarely leaves the water. And there's a map there that shows you the, the position of the lake that it comes from. It's only known from that one lake. Uh, the South China group <clears throat> is uh, two species of Morophis. They were formerly in the genus in Hydrus. And uh, there's a Morophis benedii there that has grabbed the mud skipper. This is a, a brackish uh, a marine water species and uh, obviously a fish eater. Uh, Morophis chinensis also eats fish as well as frogs. It's uh, found a little bit farther north into China, but also in uh, North Vietnam. And then there's this fossorial terrestrial group, which is extremely interesting. Just looking at the morphology, I think that both of them are probably prefossorial, uh, as well as being aquatic. But uh, very, very little is known about them. They both have a distribution that uh, is on the, in the greater Sunda shelf area. And then the uh, South Asian group is four genera and at least six species. These uh, are pretty, again, all of these are pretty poorly known. Uh, very few ecological studies have been done on them. Uh, the most recently described one is Geophis salwanensis, which was described by Evan Hua and company in uh, 2017. Uh, Diarostis used to be in the genus Anhydrus. It is uh, restricted to the southwest coast of India. Basically, it lives in coastal lagoons along the coast of Kerala. And uh, it's been reported to bite humans while they're swimming. Whether or not that's actually holds up or not, I don't know. But people have told me, a couple of people have told me it does. And then you see this uh, Forania simoldii. Uh, a fairly large snake, which has an unusually short head. And it lives in the big rivers that drain the uh, uh, Himalayas that cut across peninsular India. Oh, and when I should point out, I don't have any photos of Mittenophis, but uh, Mittenophis is named after uh, Sherman Minton, who uh, actually had some field experience with this snake in the Indus River Delta of uh, Pakistan. Very unusual snake. It has very narrow ventrals anteriorly, and then they broaden uh, posteriorly. And the head is small, and the anterior body is quite slender. Uh, the Pahan mud snake, it's a monotypic genus because we didn't really know what else to do with it. Uh, it's, it's probably going to be uh, so that that's probably going to be supported by the molecular data once they get some tissue from it. It can be sequenced. The uh, snake lives up as high as 300 meters and it lives in gravelly, rocky bottomed rivers. It was described by Michael Tweedy, but I don't think there's been any more than three or four specimens that have been found to date. And then there's the genus in Hydrus. Um, basically, right now there's six species in the genus. And um, in Hydrus and Hydrus and in Hydrus subtaniata were long uh, considered by us at least to be, you know, the two, the two most common species. These are the ones that you, fi you find a lot. In Hydrus and Hydrus pretty much dominates most of the aquatic ecosystems it's found in, in terms of just numbers of individuals. So uh, the middle one there is labeled E is uh, anhydrous jaggeri. And there's sort of a lot of uh, confusion surrounding the snake. Uh, when I started re getting specimens labeled in hydrus jaggeri from uh, museum collections, I found that there was really three species that museums had labeled in hydrus jaggeri. Uh, there was the real in hydrus jaggeri. There was in hydrus subtaniata, which had been previously described by a French uh, herpetologist, René Barre, in the 1920s. And he had described it as a subspecies of anhydrous. And then there was another undescribed species that we uh, described as Anhydrus chenardi. I have never 
been able to find a, a population of Chinardi. Uh, I, I suspect they were all living on the Chow Phrae Delta, which is basically the river delta the Bangkok is built on. The uh, real anhydrous jaggeri, we, we spent quite a bit of time looking for this. We didn't find it until 2004 when we found it quite a distance away from where we thought it would be. And I'll show you a map of that in a minute. Uh, today we know that uh, in Naminata, Jaguarai and Longicarda are all very closely related to each other. And it an, would be a t entirely appropriate to put them into one species. But the three populations are all allopatric. So they're, they're not, as far as we know, they don't overlap. And uh, I believe it's in Naminata has some sexual dimorphic traits that you don't see in Jaguarai or Longicauda. And so uh, because of those things, we sort of just left them alone. But they are difficult to tell apart. And, uh, I, and I still get people sending me emails asking me, well, how do I tell Jaguarai from Subtaniata and Shinardi? And uh, those are actually pretty easy to tell apart compared to uh, distinguishing between Innominata, Jaguarai, and, and Longicauda. So the, uh, th this is a photo of the uh, real anhydrous Jaguarai, and it has absolutely fantastic camouflage for its eyes. If you look at the, uh, the sclera of the, the eyeball, you'll see that it blends in almost perfectly with the surrounding scales. And really, the only way you'd know those are eyes is because of the presence of the pupil. Uh, there's a photo there of Daryl Carnes and a, and a fisherman from a little village called Bungalow that we accidentally stumbled into. And when we showed the fisherman the photos of Anhydrus jaguarai, they recognized it as being there. And sure enough, within a couple of days, they had collected specimens for us. So here's the position of uh, that red star in the upper, on the map on the upper uh, right-hand corner shows you the position of the location where we found Anhydrus jaguarai. And again, Anhydrus shenardi is probably restricted to the Bangkok area. Subtaniata is pretty widespread in the Indochina Peninsula and is probably going to turn out to be at least two or three species. So we were really focused on anhydrous and hydrous, and that map on the left shows all the different locations that we had collected um, anhydrous from. Uh, over This was over a period of about uh, nine or ten years. And I started working up the scale count data on some of these, and there was some uh, interesting differences, um, particularly in ventral counts, but there was also interesting differences in patterns. You can, if you look at this, now remember that, that map is just tie locations, a few tie locations. But on the middle map there, you can see it's, uh, the anhydrous and hydrous is found along the uh, east coast of India. It goes up into Nepal and then across Bangladesh down into Myanmar and Thailand and the Malaysian Peninsula across the Indochina, Indochinese Peninsula. And then it's in uh, Sumatra, Java, Borneo, and Sulawesi. So when we ran some preliminary DNA work, we found there was quite a bit of structure um, in those uh, Thai populations. And so it looks to me like in Hydrus and Hydrus, again, is a uh, complex of, of cryptic species. The uh, Pangtada group <clears throat> is primarily an Indo-Chinese Sunda Shelf uh, species or group. The two top uh, species are Anhydrous uh, Dorie on the right and Anhydrous Gii on the left. And uh, Phytolophus punctata there is also uh, in this group. And it's interesting because it, it seems to be specialized in blackwater habitats. Its diet is still somewhat of a mystery. And it, it's remarkably large. It gets to be um, Pretty close to it. The biggest one I measured is a little uh, over, I think, uh, 800 millimeters or so. The uh, the other thing that seems to be going on, at least in the in the two homolophus there, the the gii and the uh, uh, dorier, is that um, there's some 
anecdotal evidence that they change color. And uh, whether or not this is related to temperature or light or some social situation or stress is undetermined at this point in time. So the saltwater group consists of four monotypic genera, uh, two are widespread, Gerarda and Fordonia, and two are Sunda shelf endemics. And the uh, Gerarda prepostiana is a really interesting little snake that, uh, that the homolopsid group sort of uh, uncovered some really interesting aspects of its natural history. Uh, little was known about it. The type location was in the Philippines. I found about a half a dozen specimens that had been collected by Ed Taylor in the 60s, and he said they had been collected in mangrove forests in Thailand. So uh, at a little inquiry at the uh, University of Singapore turned up a couple of grad students who had found these uh, snakes when they were excavating mud lobster mounds. Mud lobsters are sort of the earthworms of the mangrove forest. They burrow through the mud. They eat the organic material. Whatever is not digestible, they pile it up outside their burrow. And some of these piles of debris get to be pretty large. You can see there's a tree growing on that mound right there. And it took uh, us about uh, most of a, a morning to excavate that mound so that you could actually see the little tunnel that mud lobster makes as it uh, moves around inside of a, its mound. So we didn't find any uh, Gerarda inside the mound, but when we go out at night and look around these mud lobster mines, mounds, we would see them swimming in the water there, and they were, they were easily collected. Now, since they were known to eat mud lobsters and crabs and other crustaceans, they, be, they were of interest because... Uh, there are relatively few snakes that feed on crustaceans. So Bruce Jane and uh, Harold Boris got pretty interested in this. They spent a couple of months in Singapore, and they collected some Gerarda. When they tried to feed them crabs, they totally ignored the crabs until they put in a, cr a crab that had recently molted. So there's the, you can see the snake's forebody there. There's a white circle represents the diameter of the snake's body. And the crab is the, the size proportional to the, the size of the crab that was eaten by the snake. And what the snake does is it gets around having to open up its mouth really wide and swallow the crab whole by throwing a couple of loops of its body around the crab and then ripping it apart, which has given rise to the interesting name crab ripping. And it's now been found to be in Gerarda, Fordonia, it's been recently reported in the natricid genus Opistotrophus, and it's probably also going to occur in some other aquatic snakes that also have evolved to eat uh, crabs. Um, Yukoella et al. 2017 looked at the genetic difference between Gerarda in, in Singapore and Gerarda in, in uh, Sri Lanka. And they found they were about 3% genetically different, which suggests to me that, again, there's probably multiple cryptic species in this. Uh, this is a coastal snake. Probably any place you've got mangrove swamps with mud lobsters, you're going to find uh, Gerarda. And then Bidia hydroides. Uh, this is, again, a relatively poorly known snake. But everything that we do know about its biology is really the result of two nights of collecting specimens in uh, the Straits of Malacca at Moir. And uh, Bruce Jane and Harold Boris collected probably 60 or 70 of these things over the course of two nights. And then after that, they all disappeared. There weren't any more. Uh, Bidia is, is pretty obviously convergent with sea snakes, except for the fact that it lacks a uh, paddle-like tail. And uh, it's got these interesting scales, which only partially cover the skin, leaves gaps between the scales. Uh, it's tempting to think that that's probably for absorbing uh, oxygen directly from the water. Cantoria violacea is another uh, interesting marine species. Uh, the ones that I looked in, I only found uh, 
remains of Elpheus shrimp. These are little shrimp that are sometimes called pistol shrimp. They have a big, one big claw that they are able to close very, very rapidly, and it makes a popping sound. And um, it, it's uh, it's used to help them catch uh, catch prey, but these uh, Cantoria are are pretty good at finding them and eating them. They probably go right down into the intertidal burrow system and look for the the crabs in the in the uh, burrows that are in the mud that are made by other crabs or shrimp or snakes. The uh, Australasian clade <clears throat> is four genera and six species. Three of them are monotypic. Two of the genera are saltwater tolerant. The uh, photo there is of uh, what used to be called in Hydrus polylepis. It's now in the genus Pseudoforania polylepis. Uh, it looks sort of like an anhydrous uh, from Indochina, but in fact, it's most closely related to a saltwater species called Myron Richardsonii. Uh, Myron Richardsonii is a mangrove marine species. It's, it's a pretty small snake. Rarely do they get more than 40 or 50 uh, centimeters. And um, they are uh, crab and uh, fish and mollusk eaters. This guy, this uh, Pseudophrenia, is a, is a fish eater. And in this group, this Australasian group, you also find Hurina ventromaculata, only known from one specimen from a river in northern New Guinea. And also uh, a, a snake that used to be in the genus Cantoria, I ended up moving it to a genus I called Joko Ishkandaris, which is named after uh, Joko Ishkandar, from, uh, who's an a Indonesian herpetologist. Um, I suspect that uh, the annulatus, polylepis, and the myron are all uh, descended from one ancestor. And then also in Australia, Asia, you find a Cerberus and uh, Pordonium. So homolapsids apparently invaded Australasia three, at least three different times. The uh, Sunda group Another very interesting group of uh, homolopsids includes um, Subsessor bucorti. That's this big, massive snake that you see on the left. It's a close-up of the, the head. And then it, there's one of the, the photo on the bottom there is a, uh, a Subsessor with a, an adult female with an adult female and hydrus, and hydrus in there. Both the anhydrous and hydrus and a subsessor bucorti are large, the, some of the largest of their species. And just by looking at these, you can tell these snakes have not had a really recent common ancestor, uh, even though they were both placed in the genus in hydrus for a long time. Uh, there's also a Sumatranus elbomaculatus, which is known only from the northern end of Sumatra. Uh, again, another poorly known snake. And then there is Herpeton tentaculatus, which I think is probably uh, the most unusual and one of the neatest snakes on the planet. Uh, this is a photograph taken through a scanning electron microscope by uh, Ken Catania. It was on the cover of the Journal of Experimental Biology uh, back in 2010. I got a, a live Herpeton when we were in uh, Songs Club working down in Sankla, and I set it up in an aquarium in a lab, and I put about 50 um, young Siamese fighting fish or bettas in with the uh, the Erpeton. I set up a video camera. And um, these are highly aquatic snakes. I strongly suspect they're like a lot of the sea snakes. They, they just don't come out of the water. Uh, they're in the water all the time. And the ventral scales are very narrow. Each one has got two keels on it. There's a photo showing you the size and relationship to the dorsal scale right there. When I looked at the tentacles, I noticed that all the scales laid forwards. And even though some people had suggested that they did not have a function, 
which I found hard to believe. But I, I strongly suspected that they were sensory organs because the, the scales laying forwards, they would be uh, moved a little bit as a current of water hit them. And there was there was even papers that denied the fact that they were not, that they were sensory organs, but uh, they are in fact sensory organs. So I use my uh, sort of just commercially available video camera to uh, film them eating, and when I analyzed the film, I found that the fish was disappearing within one frame. So the in other words, the, the video camera was taking pic for a picture at about 60 frames per second. So within one sixtieth of a second, the uh, fish was disappearing from the uh, from the water, and the snake was obviously swallowing with the strike. So uh, here you see another electron uh, scanning electron microscope photo of an anhydrous. You can see how the scales are arranged on tentacles. And Ken Catani came out with a paper in um, 2009, and he showed exactly what the snakes were doing in terms of catching food. They sit in a J position in the water. Their head is kind of turned back towards their body. Uh, they sense when the fish gets close to their head, probably using the tentacles, because even though they've got very large eyes for a homolopsid, they are living in pretty muddy water most of the time. So they're probably depending on those tentacles to let them know that there's a fish there. Um, when the fish is in position, the snake sends a wave of muscle contraction down its body, and it uh, triggers the fish to move away from the wave of water, and the fish moves right towards the, the snake's head. The snake opens up its mouth, grabs the fish and swallows it. And this happens in the span of about uh, 25 to 30 uh, milliseconds. And so this sort of explained why those, those fish were disappearing within one frame of my uh, video camera. Homolopsis um, was considered to be a monotypic genus for a long time. Uh, it was one species, Homolopsis bucata. It's uh, an interesting snake. It's heavily hunted for its skins. They get turned into leather products. Uh, they get made into shoes and purses and belts. But um, when I saw these, a couple of specimens that uh, had been collected in Thailand, I realized in the, in the Mekong drainage, I realized that um, it was a quite different snake. And as it turned out that Mekong uh, drainage homolopsis already had been described by a French herpetologist named DeVoe. He called it uh, Homolopsis bucata nigroventralis. And it was the name was appropriate. Most uh, homolopsis have got uh, sort of cream-colored bellies with dark uh, uh, rows of dark spots uh, on the edges of each of the uh, ventral scales. When you flip this guy over, it had a black venter with white spots. In other words, it was the reverse of what you see in Bucata. And so um, I sort of spent a long time sort of puzzling over homolapsis. And uh, I resurrected some old names <clears throat> and uh, described one new species. So that there are now five species in the genus. There's still one species that I have not described as as new, but uh, there's a, a grad student working on, on these and other homolopsis right now, and I think he'll probably end up resolving how, how many species are actually in, uh, in homolopsis. Cerberus clade, um, this one was a, a real puzzle. Uh, when I started working on these in the early 90s, uh, Harold Cogger has basically taken the position that uh, Cerberus was one species that went from the uh, west coast of India all the way out to Palau, Micronesia, down into Australasia. Um, when I started looking at different populations, the scale counts sort of started falling out into different groups. 
and we got some DNA from a couple of different populations. The Australian one was quite distinct from um, the rent the rent shops and um, the one in Palau really had a, a different look to it. It had really thick overlapping scales on it. So uh, we ended up describing a couple of new species and um, resurrecting some some old names. Homolapsis can reach really homolapsis can reach really high population densities. Uh, this was this was true for anhydrous and hydrous, and uh, it's true for Cerberus. Uh, Chim and Deong, 2013, uh, looked at uh, Cerberus schneideri at some man-made ponds in uh, Singapore, and they found 102 snakes per hectare. Um, I, there's been a couple of places where we've looked at Cerberus, and I suspect that they easily exceed that number. Um, and anhydrous and hydrous is also, it's it's way up there in terms of uh, high population densities. Uh, at one at one place in Sankla, we estimated um, if you if you took the linear measurements of the ditches, there was like one snake for every two meters of uh, shoreline. So uh, here's an anhydrous and hydrous in the water. You can see that little uh, tadpole. On, on its back there. It's in the process of metamorphizing. Um, so out of the two, 235 snakes that we pit tagged, uh, we did get some recaptures, and I think we got 144 recaptures. Preliminary results suggested 406 to about 567 uh, in hydras were present at that study site at Stonkla. And so it worked out to about one snake for every two meters of shoreline. So I'd like to wrap this up, um, but I want to talk a little bit about the great Cambodian snake harvest at Townley Sap. Uh, the average is estimated at about 3.8 3 million snakes per year. Most of them are homolapsids. And there's a, a long involved story about uh, the uh, hydrology involved in this, but uh, Townley Sap is a lake that it's the largest lake in Southeast Asia, and it expands and contracts by about 50% every year. And uh, these snakes spend a lot of time down in the mud, and then when the lake floods, they come up and uh, become active. And the fishermen catch them in, in gill nets, and they uh, collect them in huge numbers. And some of them are used for human food. This lady is uh, cooking uh, some anhydrous and hydrous on her grill there. And there's a plate on the upper right-hand corner that of cooked anhydrous that are ready to go to the dinner table. If you go into the markets, you see big piles of homolopsids. Sometimes they've got their uh, digest their abdomen cut open, and they pull they pull out the eggs, the oviducts, so that you can see that they're they're rich in fat molecules. And even though people will eat some of them, the vast majority of them go to feed crocodiles and if you in in some of the nearby towns Siem Reap is the one that we worked out of uh, if you walk up to the nicest house you can find in the town knock on their front door and say can we see your crocodiles they will take you into their backyard and show you a cemented backyard that's got lots of uh, concrete ponds with uh, crocodiles in them they're mostly uh, Siamese crocodiles but there's also uh, Cuban crocodiles there, and they hybridize the Cuban and Siamese uh, crocodiles, and they sell them for their skins. So uh, the geography of uh, marine invasions by snakes, the Sunda Shelf is a 1.85 million square kilometer marine wetland complex. This is where you find the acrocordids, the marine homolopsids, the uh, true sea snakes, the sea crates. So this has sort of been a, an incubator for um, marine uh, evolution of snakes, the evolution of snakes into marine environments. You find other snakes that have managed to invade marine environments scattered in other locations, but uh, that uh, Southeast Asia, Sunda Shelf area is sort of the center of it. 
So in summary, the fam family homolopsis DD is endemic to Southeast Asia and Australasia. Uh, homolopsis are an ancient lineage of snakes adapted to many diverse environments and lifestyles. Some are brackish and freshwater homolopsids, others, and some are convergent in some aspects of morphology and life history with the true sea snakes. Uh, some homolopsids are highly aquatic fish specialists, others specialize in feeding on crustaceans. And the most basal homolopsids are the fangless uh, terrestrial species. And humans harvest homolopsids in very large numbers at uh, Tonley Sap. Last thing, Aquatic Snake Project. I'm trying to put together a, an overview of aquatic snakes of the world. If you have some photos, stories, or you want to author a small section of this, uh, let me know. I've got a couple of people interested uh, as of the present, but uh, this is just sort of getting started. If you're interested, send me a, you can contact me at serpentresearch at gmail.com. And that is the end. I guess I was just curious, um, you know, John, having so much uh, extensive work with homolopsids, you know, have you ever been bitten by one and have you ever had any sort of, uh, you know, envenomation or like any kind of uh, sort of distressing sequelae that was associated with the bite itself? Well, uh, you know, one night I was out uh, walking around some ponds and I saw the uh, the very distinctive pattern of a homolopsis bucata that was um, had its head down in the in the water. It was probably fishing. And I uh, just walked up to it and I grabbed it and I pulled it out of the water and it it raked its uh, teeth across my hand. And for just a short amount of time, there was a pretty distinctive burning sensation. You know, it just kind of scratched the, the surface of the skin and, and drew a little bit of blood. But uh, that's really the only time I felt anything. I know Daryl Daryl Carnes, uh, I think he had uh, been uh, nailed by a, a plumbia and at one point and had a slight reaction to that also. Mm -hmm. But nothing serious. Hmm. Any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, this is Max. I have a question. Uh, you said, I guess, certain species of those are eatable, and uh, I guess people use it at the, uh, the dinner table. Does it apply to all the snakes, or only to certain snake is eatable? And uh, I guess, uh, how does it taste? Um, Okay, I'm 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 not sure I got all of your question. Could you could you just give it to me one piece at a time? <laughs> all are all the species eatable, or only certain species are eatable? Oh, I see. Uh, I think uh, I think that most of them are edible. Um, you know, I I I think a lot of them. Uh, you know, the Chinese. Uh, I think buy a lot of these homolopsid snakes for traditional medicines, and they they also eat them in in large numbers. Not only homolopsids, but a lot of other uh, a lot of other uh, snakes of, in different families. They eat vipers and pythons and uh, all kinds of colubrids. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And uh, how does it taste? Is it same as chicken or it has a specialty? I don't know. Have you ever tasted them or not? <laughs> yeah. You know, the only snake that I've ever eaten was a, was a rattlesnake. And um, it, it has a fairly distinctive uh, taste and texture to it. I, you know, a lot of people compare it to chicken, but I would say that it's not does not taste very much like chicken. The texture is, is, is kind of different. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, as far as I know, uh, courtship and mating, you know, is is pretty similar to what you see in other snakes. Um, you know, the male has hemipens and they uh, line them up with the female's vent and insert them. And uh, 
it, you know, there's there's uh, cases in, in some ways they're a lot like garter snakes or or nerodia. They a lot of times they'll, they'll be like mating balls. Uh, there'll be multiple males trying to mate with a, a single female. Um, every every litter that has been examined shows that it's the re, the uh, product of multiple paternity. So uh, you know the females are using sperm competition uh, to some degree, and uh, the uh, the young are carried uh, in the uh, in the uh, uterus. Uh, until they're they're pretty much ready to be born, the uh, as far as we know, none of them lay eggs. There's been a couple of studies done in unusual places, um, and the, they've not been published in in like mainstream journals that suggest that uh, there's a placental connection between the embryo and the female's uh, circulatory system so that uh, the female will put so much energy into the yolk and then that'll get the embryo so far and then she apparently continues to supply them with nutrients um, after they've uh, used up the yolk uh, via her circulatory system. Um, there, there's, you know, nobody has really studied this very carefully in homolapses, but there's a couple of papers Interestingly enough, uh, one of them, I think it was, it was done in India and it was done with what was called, um, was, even though it's not a rare snake, it was rare in collections for a very long time. And uh, some Indian scientist, grad student, did this big study on uh, anhydrous Dusermeyeri, uh, but it was never really published in a, in a readily accessible journal, it's in my it's in my literature uh, review of the homolapsids. But um, so, you know, when they're born, they're they're pretty much uh, they they pretty much seem to be on their own. And hom homolapsids and in hydrus uh, bucorti or subsessor bucorti, they have. They have pretty good sized offspring compared to let's say in hydrus and hydrus, which has pretty tiny offspring. Inter interesting. Uh, uh, what about the defensive uh, posture and uh, structure that they, they use? Any any specific defensive um, method they use, or is it just like other? Um, water is next, let's say. Yeah, you know, I, I have handled a lot of them, and every once in a while, one of them will open its mouth and sort of threaten you, but honestly, most of the time, they they never try to bite. And, uh, I mean, we hundred we handle just hundreds and hundreds of them, particularly in hydrus and hydrus. And usually, they're, to me, it looks to me like their main defense is chemical. That is, they release that cloacal musk um when you uh, restrain them you know when they're when they really get uh spooked they they in defense of that uh, that uh, musk is released but um usually even cerberus i mean they'll open their mouth they might try to bite you but they're pretty uh they're pretty mellow snakes in terms of actually uh trying to not you know they don't seem to want to bite you for any any like like a Nerodia would. They, they don't get really super aggressive like that. Which is, I guess, probably just as well, because doesn't Chinensis have a fairly high LD50? Yeah, it does. But remember, you know, these these LD50s, these fangs are, are rear fangs. So in order for them to g get, give you a good shot of venom, they got to open their mouth up, they got to grab you, and then they got to chew on you a little bit mm -hmm. to get the venom into the wound. Right. So, um, you know, if you smelled like a fish or a frog or a crab, you might you might have a problem. But um, unless you smell like food, food to them, I'm my guess is is that they really wouldn't um, try to chew on you at all. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, 
I mean, the, the, there's they're not very common in collections. And, um, you know, I mean, it's a matter of going out and looking for them and and finding them in the right habitat. I'm guessing that they're not particularly rare once you get into those peat swamps. And um, those peat swamps, they've sort of got their own their own fauna. And that uh, Phytolophus is, seems to be, you know, part of it. I, um, it's, it's a snake that I'm pretty interested in, and it would be interesting to compare them from different localities to see how they differ. If they're, because if they're restricted to those peat swamps, uh, my guess is, is that there's not a lot of movement between uh, the different peat swamps, and they may be uh, evolving, you know, in the different species in those, in those different uh, swampy areas. Maybe uh, there may be there may be Cerberus homolopsis hybrid homolopsis hybrids, but uh, I don't have any real hard evidence for it, other than uh, sometimes you would find snakes that seem to have characteristics of both Cerberus and, and homolopsis, and um, you know I, I was sort of suspicious about it. I mean, it really, I. Th I think that the only way to, to go about proving that there's actually hybrids is to look at microsatellite uh, DNA, and uh, that's a fairly involved process. Mm. But it would not it would not surprise me. I mean, reptiles seem to be able to retain this ability to hybridize long after they have evolved in, in different directions. And it's one of the things that causes, I think, arguments among herpetologists in terms of how they're going to define a species and you got people that want to define species very broadly because they find some evidence that there's introgression you know between uh species that have been recognized before and they say well we should call these all the same species because they still interbreed with each other i don't know that that's uh an argument that I would want to try to defend. I, um, it just seems like like reptiles, um, you know, human and chimps are two percent different. I don't see anybody wanting wanting to call humans and chimps the same species. Um, okay. And so, but if you've got a snake that's three or four or five percent, there that are three or four or five percent different from each other, uh, that doesn't seem to. Uh, you know, people will say, oh, we should just call them all the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I would agree with that. As much as I could. <laughs> okay. I, uh, yeah, well, we, you know, there, we wrote this paper, myself and Harold Boris and Daryl Carnes and some other people, where we looked at, at homolopsis and, you know, we divided it up into five different species. Some of those, you know, um, I suspect may contain other species uh, that are undescribed. And in some cases, some of them may have to be synonymized. But it's going to take a big, a big uh, molecular data sample to sort all those guys out. Okay. On behalf of everybody who participated, I would like to thank... John for this wonderful presentation. Um, at least I learned a lot. Uh, I hope the rest of you too. We say thank you and if, if John, if you want to close the session with a word of advice for the rest of us. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, only thing, the only thing I can say is, is that uh, homolopsids deserve uh, a pretty careful look because I, I think that they're extremely interesting snakes. They represent a, an unusual radiation of snakes. Um, they are uh, they've got lots of uh, lots of things to tell us about uh, the history of uh, and, and evolution of uh, of snakes. I hope everybody has a. Good night, good morning. I, I, I guess on the other side of the world this morning. Uh, again, John, thank for uh, generously providing your time.
uh, to us to to get these things uh, done. And uh, again, I wish more people were here and enjoy this uh, wonderful presentation. Very informative. Sure. I wish yes. everybody have a good time, and we will end the session at this point. Thank right, you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. thanks, bye -bye. All right. Thank you.